Everywhere you look, one of your colleagues, friends, maybe even a family member is learning something new. New technologies, learning something new, and I don't know about you, but I feel like I am constantly feeling like I'm on my own and kind of behind the game. I mean, there are so many different things to learn and where do I put my energy going into 2024? All right, we've done a lot of these videos where we talk about where to put your focus going into the new year, what technologies you should be learning. I thought this would be really fun to kind of go back in time a little and take a look at some technologies that already are existing, already out there for quite a long time, which I will not be learning in 2024. Also, as a side note, gotta jump in here again. Well, I, I just moved over a little bit, but if you haven't signed up for Takeoff yet, you need to. I have seen such an influx, yeah, an influx, that's the word, right? Of <laughs> registrations on Takeoff. It makes me so happy. And if you haven't heard about Takeoff yet, this is a new platform that I founded a few months ago. And the reason being is I kept on getting asked from people like yourself around, where do I go to network to build these relationships? Where do I go to find mentors? I wanna keep up on the latest and greatest technology that is out there. Where can you go where this is all housed in one place? And that is Takeoff. We've started with speakers. We're releasing a speaker probably right now about every two weeks. In the new year, we will also be releasing different workshops, both technical and non-technical. The first one that someone is already working on is around AWS. And I'm just gonna leave it there very broad, but it's gonna be amazing. So really, Takeoff is a place where you can come and learn at your own pace from real industry insiders, people who actually work in the tech industry. You're not learning from influencers, you're not learning from YouTubers, <laughs> you're learning from people who actually work in the tech industry for many, many years and can provide their expertise, their guidance, alongside with the workshops for both technical and non-technical. So if you are someone, once again, technical or non-technical, but wants to stay up to date with tech, have those online mentors build that network, go join Takeoff. I get very passionate about this. We're gonna stop it there because it's amazing. All right, let's start. I've done a few of these videos on technologies I would no longer learn. I'll link them down below, but I'm telling you, the challenge for this video is because I've done a few other ones, I really had to dig deep as to what technologies that I haven't spoken about already would I not be learning in 2024. Now there are a lot and some probably controversial because they're still widely used. When I say I will not be learning, I wanna share with you some context. I mean, I will not be going out of my way on my free time to learn these technologies. It doesn't mean they're bad. It doesn't mean they're not in demand. It just means it doesn't make sense for myself anyways. And I would say for most people to pick up these new, when they're not new technologies, they're old technologies, but to pick up these technologies if you are looking to invest your time into learning something that is in demand, relevant, high paying, and will really grow with the future of tech. All right, coming in at number one is traditional manual server management and deployment. So first of all, what exactly is this before we get into why I wouldn't learn it in 2024? So in traditional environments, server management and deployment involved a lot, to say the least, of manual tasks. So here's how it kind of mapped out. First of all, there are physical server setup, so physically installing and configuring servers in data centers. Still very common, obviously. Software installation, so manually installing operating systems, middleware, and applications. And then we have configuration, setting up configurations for each application, which could vary from server to server. This is a very manual process, followed by scaling. I mean, you have to physically add more servers to handle increased load. And then of course there is maintenance. So here's an example as to what that used to look like. So a company runs a web application that requires setting up and maintaining several physical servers, manually installing the web server software, databases, and managing network configuration. So what would I learn today in 2024 instead of all those manual processes? For me, it would be more modern practices such as containerization, orchestration, etc. So let's look at containerization such as Docker. We've all seen this cute little whale here. I mean, why is it a whale? Can we get to the bottom of this, please? So containerization involves encapsulating an application and its dependencies into a container that can run on any computing environment. So of course, this really helps ensure consistency across multiple development, testing, and production environments. It really can be consistent across different platforms. Let's go through an example of Docker though. So using Docker, a developer can package a web application with all its dependencies into a container. 
this container can then be run on any machine. So it doesn't have to be your specific machine. Where does that mean when we need it? Where it's like, well, it works on my machine. All right, let's dive into orchestration. So let's say this is a great example of Kubernetes. Orchestration tools manage the life cycle of the containers that we just spoke about in large dynamic environments. So these, when you think large environments, of course, large tech companies that have a massive environments that need to be managed. So with something like orchestration tools, such as Kubernetes, the benefits are they automate deployment, scaling, management, and containerized applications. So let's use an example of this. A company that uses Kubernetes to manage a cluster of containers, Kubernetes can then automatically handle the deployment of these containers across a cluster, manages their health, and scales them up or down based on traffic. The next one is SOAP. No, not the kind of SOAP you're thinking of. SOAP meaning Simple Object Access Protocol for web services. So this is still something that is widely used, but I'm gonna share with you, well, first I'm gonna share with you what it is and then why I wouldn't be learning it. SOAP was widely used for building web services, which are applications to communicate over a network, typically the internet. And it's really known for its strict specifications and reliance on XML or extensible markup language. It really requires oftentimes extensive setup and is very heavy weight in terms of bandwidth and resources. So what are the alternatives? Well, the tech community really shifted towards more lightweight and flexible alternatives like REST and GraphQL. I mean, everywhere you look now, people are raving about using GraphQL. That's something I would learn in 2024, by the way. So let's dive into both of these. REST, representational state transfer. REST uses standard HTTP methods and is considered more efficient, easier to understand, and better suited for web applications needs. Then we have GraphQL which is a newer, I mean, it's not really that new anymore, but newer technology. And it allows clients to request exactly the data they need, nothing else other than what exactly they need, which of course makes it more efficient, especially for complex applications. All right, number three is something I've spoken about before, Perl. Why am I speaking about it again? Because I feel like the first time I covered it, I didn't do it justice as to what exactly it is and also to why I'm not gonna be learning it. That was one that I got, <laughs> gotta put the green screen down. I got a lot of comments being like, why not Pearl? I love Pearl, I use Pearl. There is no hate towards Pearl. I think Pearl is still very wide. All right, let's just explain what it is first. Okay, Pearl. Pearl is known for its versatility and used for system administration, network programming, web development, and more. So it's really versatile and used across various really different platforms. And if you're familiar with C, it uses a lot of similar, or it has a lot of similarities to the programming language C. So that's kind of a similar uh, aspect to it. And it can be used across various different platforms. However, here's why I would not learn Pearl in 2024. Well, I mean, the first one is, I don't know the last time I've seen a job posting requiring Perl. I mean, obviously there are specific niches within that and I'm sure it pays really well because of that. So why did it decline? Definitely because, you know, when you think Python, JavaScript, they have risen and Perl has started to decline because of that. And this is because, you know, there, I mean, many different things from Python being so much easier to pick up and learn to being more versatile even. And same with JavaScript, not to mention with Python. It's been so widely integrated, not only into web development or software development, but also too into data data science, machine learning, pretty much many different buckets within the tech industry. All right, and my last ones, I had to add these in mainly for fun because it's really cool to look back on old tech. I will not be learning in 2024, and I hope for this one you will not either, which is Adobe Flash, and then also to Microsoft Silverlight. So let's go through what I, these are. So Adobe Flash was a dominant platform for producing rich media content on the web, and it was really used for creating animations. It was popular for web designers for its ability to create visually appealing and dynamic websites. So it was often difficult to achieve these interactive uh, things with HTML and CSS, and it was often used before JavaScript. Yes, there was a time before JavaScript. <laughs> So why did it decline? What happened? Well, obviously with the rise of JavaScript, that is a main one, but also there was a lot of other issues. One being security concerns. So Flash had a number of security vulnerabilities leading to it being really easily targeted by uh, hackers and malware. And actually Adobe announced the end of Flash support in 2020. So it's not something that's even supported anymore. However, I think it could be fun just to, no, it wouldn't be fun. I was gonna say to build something with it, maybe? I don't know. Would you learn Flash even though it's still not supported? All right, let's move on to Microsoft Silverlight. We are doing another back to the future or back 
to the past, I guess. So basically you can think of uh, Silverlight as Microsoft's answer to Flash. So it was used for streaming media, graphics, and animation. And similar to its competitor, Adobe Flash, when different programming languages such as JavaScript came onto the scene, we really saw a decline in Silverlight. Similar to, I didn't even mention this with Adobe Flash, but also to Microsoft Silverlight, they both require plugins, which can become a really big barrier as browsers and users move more towards a plugin-free web uh, for security and performance reasons. So we really saw a decline as the web really shifted. All right, those are my top four technologies that I will not be learning in 2024. Curious to hear, do you agree with me? Do you disagree? What other ones would you add in the mix? Leave in the comments. I think this is such a good discussion to have and a really important topic to cover because we need to look back on the past to see how things have evolved, some better than others, as to learn where we are going and moving forward with technology. Also, as a side note, I make all my YouTube videos based on what you want to see, questions you have. So leave in the comments any topics you want me to cover, questions you have, and I will ensure to make them. All right, thank you all. Make sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't, and I will see you soon.